Right. Shall uh, shall we? Do, I'll I'll share my screen and I'll continue okay. with, um, oh, yeah. what oh. we did last week. Um, yeah, I ran so, of them, but yeah, we could go ahead and look at your screen. That's cool. Uh, so if we just finish this one and then um, yeah. then I haven't rendered the other one, which um, okay, then we could swap over, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So we got quite far through this, didn't we? Yeah, we only had nine seven or ten seven. So, so this whole chapter was just about adding additional predictors in and then right. saying what's the effect of them and then you know how do you make sure that you've you know got all the right information. And I presume we got down to this part about the ethnicity and it's all one hot coded baseline factor. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not particularly complicated. Um, yeah, they went into, I saw they don't like T tests and S tests, which is yeah. what I generally hear. They just said in the real world with enough data, any hypothesis can be rejected. Well, true. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. So they said, look, it. Yeah, standard errors as well as parameter estimates and use Bayesian inference when estimates are noisy. Mm. So they, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so essentially what we end up with is uh, so did we get to this part last time about the different I feel like we got to 10 7, yeah. I think that's where we stopped. And then there's a paired design, which is just, well, when you add it all together. Yeah. And you see it's got a Gaussian distribution. Oh, this was the weird thing about the different paired way of doing it. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, that seemed really odd, but okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it was odd, but it kind of makes sense as well. Um, kind of got where you were going. A deviation, yeah. So pair equals equals one is the reference category and the coefficient of design deviation from that. Okay. Uh, went down block design. What was block design to extend our working time where n people are in j groups? So, so this just so this is kind of similar to the one above, apart from this yeah, is about yeah. using different groups. So, it's like if you did an experiment and you said, <clears throat> Will feed. <throat> Uh, you know, if we were saying, oh, well, how hungry are people after eating, say, I don't know, a meal one, meal two, meal three, meal four, and they can be like different, like food groups. So say one is like, say, fiber, just a fiber, mostly fiber based meal, one's more a protein based meal, another one's carbs, another one's more fat based meal. Mm -hmm. Well, apart from we wouldn't have that for five because that group would be out there. Um, because the ones are intercepts, isn't it? So, so by block design, what I mean is just grouping. It's almost like binning, I suppose, which works pretty well if you're doing a between participants design, mm -hmm. uh, which I tell you not to do. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, example, uncertainty in predicting congressional elections. <coughs> and then, oh, yeah, so they do all the different elections over time. And... Uh, so you've got all of these and they are used to predict oh yeah we did get to that didn't we data issues oh these are the data not being cleaned up I think we've got to that bit as well yeah we did, did go through that I recall simulation for inferences and predictions of new data points that's just using I, I the, the thing is a lot of this so this is just a oh well, you can use posterior predict right whereas some of it's more manual stuff isn't it so you just right. put in your um your model into your posterior predict and it'll come out with the what you'd expect with given this amount of information given this x information mm -hmm. which is essentially what it does and it goes through that and then predict the simulation of non-linear function. Oh yeah, because then it starts looking at the non-linear non functions. Mm -hmm. Which it doesn't really oh, show. And we're now to, yeah. I'll move on from that. All uh, uh, oh, right, and so then it starts talking about mathematical notation about vector, um, vectorized notation, which is 
just another form of algebra, but instead of writing a, a formula, we're writing the matrix notation. Right. Two ways of writing the model. Classical linear can be written mathematically is your standard, well, the standard, which is for i through to n, uh, where the errors have independent normally distributed distributions with mean is zero. Yes, that's standard stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Yi is a product of blah, blah, where x is an n by k matrix. Or by using the, mul the multivariate notation, which is So is this implying a matrix here? Well, yeah, for the X and the beta, e, wait a minute. Yeah, if you're using blah, blah, blah. So the N signifies matrix. Is that a matrix? It's um, for I, da, 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 da. To use more compact, we can use this. And X is an N by K matrix. K I is the, oh yeah, I is the N by N identity matrix. It is true. Um, but why would they say why I when they just say why? Isn't it Y with the curly sign on top when it's yeah. a matrix? Oh yeah, yeah. Because you're, yeah. Yeah, you're predicting. Um, it's a prediction, it's not the. yeah. Yeah. And then your XI would be uh, your predictive components. That would have a wavy yeah. sign on it as well. Um, anyway, that's not what's written in the book, but never mind. Let's see what is written in the book. I have it. Yeah, it's not written in the book. Yeah, he just has. Oh, it's on the other page. They have. Yeah, the vectors of the errors and the residuals. So they just have, yeah, Y minus capital X beta is for errors. And then Y minus capital X beta hat is the residuals. And Y squiggly <laughs> is for predictions. Yes. So see figure 10, eight. Yeah, they, they um, expressed it differently. Yeah. Well, okay. So, I mean, it's not really anything that we need to particularly. Yeah, know. I feel like I understand it. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so the book is, yeah, exactly as you said. The the book has something different from from what he had. It's not y sub i. It's y <laughs> is uh, and x, and it's not x sub i. It's x beta. Yeah, but anyway, that's that's just kind of that's fine. I understand. What, what's going on? It does kind of have it. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so then, maybe we'll move yeah. on to the least squares part. So the steps of the estimation of least squares are the same as, yeah. So uh, the steps for uh, multiple predictions are the same as one predictor. The starting point um, is that the least squares estimate, that is, vector of beta that minimizes some squares residuals is the same. Uh, for standard linear regression with predictors that are measured accurately and errors that are independent of equal variance and normally distributed, the least square solution is also the maximum likelihood estimate, which we already know. Uh, Bayesian inference adds the model priors into the mix which uh, is the one thing that separate, which is the main thing that separates it. Non-identified mm. parameters, collinearity. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> All right. A model said to be non-identifiable if it contains parameters that cannot be estimated uniquely or to put it in a way that have standard errors of infinity, meaning that they can't be identified because it's kind of, uh, the way how I understood it was, if you were looking at one of those graphs, 
where you've got like gradient descent, it would be a flat area. Right. Um, so it has no the, idea where to go anyway. Yeah. 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 So if you were doing like, say, if you had like a simulated needling algorithm, it'd just go around, yeah. it's, it just wouldn't know where to move to. Um, unless, of course, it made a massive jump away from where it was. Um, the most familiar and important example of non identifiable arises from collinearity uh, or multi collinearity of predictors, a yeah. set of predictors of collinearity. <clears throat> Basically, <laughs> collinearity is a problem. Everyone says it is. You should be careful of collinearity. Um, but that's mm. usually like you can also talk about it like. It's all, basically when information is contained in other predictors, it's usually best not to use it, or you should either collapse them into uh, smaller parameters, and then you can have as much collinearity as you want, as long as you've collapsed uh, the independent predictors, and then you'll save computational time. There's the advantage. Um, hypothesis testing. <laughs> Why we don't like T-tests and F-tests. One thing we do not recommend is traditional no hypothesis tests. And that's all he said. <laughs> it doesn't even bother copying the rest of the text right, right. because they don't actually really say an awful lot on it. But the, what I put down of interest is we essentially have no interest in hypothesis for regression because we almost never encounter problems where it would make sense to think of coefficients as being exactly zero. Thus, rejection of the null hypothesis is irrelevant since this just amounts to rejecting something we never took seriously in the first place in the real world enough data any hypothesis can be rejected which it's is true. essentially true yeah. i'm not quite sure um <laughs> the fact that we base a lot of science on this um whether right you so can... much science uh, based on this uh... <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I'm, I'm not sure how much i i, I agree in principle um, with what they're saying there, but I think that the, um, and they do say this, the t-test and the f-test do have their uses. Mm -hmm. um, but they're also saying that it's used formally to reject the null hypothesis. And I suppose it is, it is used to do that, but a weak, uh, a weak test. Right. Actually, having said that, This, this, it comes down to more of an academic discussion about um, the zeitgeist and publication bias and why publication bias is so bad because you get, and get onto the parameter which they talk about earlier in the book which is that uh, it's the principle whereby if you do multiple testing right. you eventually get to uh, Gaussian distribution in terms of your findings. You're bound to find, yes, yeah, find something if you, so, if you do enough comparisons, yeah. Mm, so if you have positive uh what's it called uh, what's it called publication bias with positive findings mm -hmm. then you then you then you end up with only one side of the curve but don't you so you don't end up with a uh, even distribution balance so therefore your zeitgeist of academic knowledge is skewed uh, and it makes it much harder to refute poor research poor theories right anyway that's a different thing Right. Uh, well, we uh, reproducing results, but yeah. yeah. Um, so weighted regret that, that doesn't really bother us in our jobs, though. Uh, in in some settings, it makes sense to weight data. This makes more sense. Weights uh, data points more than others when fitting model, uh, and one can perform least weighted least squares where the estimate is beta weighted, which I believe is what WRS stands for. Mm -hmm. Is that which it minimizes uh, the sum of n through i what uh, as counter of one um, weight? Uh, so basically, you take the residual, uh, the predicted residual mm -hmm. squared, and times that by your weighted value. Is that what that's saying? I believe so. Oh, in in WI, he's basically saying right. the weighted value. Uh, is that the weighted value for each iteration of X? There's a different weight for each uh, observation. But typically speaking, you probably use one weight throughout the um, throughout the uh, JF term. 
Yeah, I don't think that it looks like they're their weight. Yeah. They've used WI, but I, yeah. I'm thinking in terms well, of uh, yeah. the vector. Press that. They use matrix algebra in the book. Let's see, WI, no, they did the same. So WI, YI, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, you're right. It does make sense because if you were like, say, um, because they talk about later, because if you were like, say, using race, right. um, your observation wouldn't be so that's the whole term. column. It would be part of the column, wouldn't it? Right. Um, yeah. Sorry, I got confused. That's cool. Um, so, post gratification. Sorry? I was just reading his uh, three contexts. Yeah. Three, three models leading through regression weighting. Uh, three contexts um, using observed, oh yeah, so using observed data to represent a larger population, uh, such as in post stratification, um, uh, which is like when we basically said about the attractive, attractive faces, okay. uh, and then use the actual information from the US census in order to work out what the proportion of females should really be by race mm. um uh, so that's an example and then duplicate observations this is quite an interesting one um such that aggregated binomial regression so that would be like uh i suppose it'd be like if you were like capturing something over time in a way but without considering the time component of it mm. it's just repeatedly sending the same information back Mm -hmm. uh, and then unequivocal, uh, unequal variances, such as in the meta-analysis. So, uh, and uh, yeah. Oh, uh, although the unequal variances is best dealt with by multi-level modeling. I was thinking, um, I was trying to think of what you would do in that case here, but you're saying, yeah, you, it would be better to just use multi-level modeling. Well, they, they basically say as much here, but they say that uh, yeah. instead, because they, if beyond the scope of the book, right. um, that oh, they, right, right. Yeah. they use a more simplified version. Um, and then well, there's yeah, other, yeah. Uh, so fitting many models to uh, a model to many data sets. And then another example is time. So, you know, if your time series, uh, mm -hmm. what, they say, what they say here is, um, oh, uh, uh, a method for repeated modeling followed by time series plots of estimates is sometimes called the secret weapon because it's so easy oh. and powerful and yet it's rarely used as a data analytic tool. We suspect one reason for its severity in use is that once one acknowledges time series structure of the data set, it is natural to want to take the next step and model that directly, which is true. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. However, having said that, having said that, when you're doing, like, say, XG boost, you don't necessarily model the time directly. You model no, it. Oh, you would have like a lag feature or something, yeah, potentially. Yeah. Anyway, um, using matrix weights, models are correlated. Uh, it's in the same model as many data sets. Sorry, we went over that. And then, oh, yeah, then there's party prediction. And then we've got this thing, and uh, what's it? They've got the ideology and then race adjusted ideology. And stuff like that. Although it seems like they've split up ra race yeah, into is. black and white, yeah. and that was it. Um, mm. Not that it really matters. It's a simple data set. It doesn't really matter. Right, right. Um, oh, so how do they do that? Case when, and that's how they split it up into different parts. So in order to account for these multi-level features, I suppose mm -hmm. they uh, they take party ID seven. And then they look at the ideology. So they're predicting party uh, 
and then they've got the ideology whether you're left or right, your race age discrete and then educational mm-hmm. level female and income mm-hmm. so that should just be sex really shouldn't it but anyway and then that gives all these features and then you can break down those individual factors because these are all additive terms at this point in time right and then you look at the individuals and it's pulled out the parameter just change the name of it right to something that's more easier to read yeah and then you just see the time series progression yeah oh well, that's something else you mentioned isn't it which is yeah. with times with uh something like this kind of analysis you can kind of consider it part as whilst it's not necessarily uh, whilst the parts aren't necessarily direct, direct samples or observations, it's like different snapshots in time. Right. Is that with the election one? You can consider, consider it as part of like a super distribution mathematically or something like that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, nice. so that takes us to the end chapter, re- realistically yeah, speaking. Um, which, and this looks kind of the way how you would normally use this kind of information anyway. Yeah, yeah. So overall, the uh, the chapter basically says you can model multiple things. You've got to be careful about uh, what you're modeling. Um, make sure you take account of uh, variances in data, such so you know there's a great deal to be said of visualizing the data. Mm-hmm. As I found out myself today, and adjusting the data. When you do adjust the data, you know, you can use simple methods where they've just centered it. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I would personally prefer to use multi, uh, what's it, uh, multivariate imputation. Yeah. Um, and then you should always simulate your inferences, your predictions for new points. And then you can, when you've got multiple different kind of outcomes, you can split up your data into those different grouping variables. So that then you can make predictions based on uh, a really large number of outcomes as to what, what area it is in. Uh, what was that? That was um, like what state or what, what area of what state. Although I would have thought you'd have done it as a factor level, but they did it as a uh, level Y. That's fine. Yeah, that that's is really, interesting they chose that. But yeah. That was really cool. Um, yeah, and that, that's it, really, for the chapter. Yeah. I feel like there was one. Oh, the, the one I was wondering about is in the next chapter. So I guess I'll wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah. So that gives me time to do it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So do you want to go, uh, oh yeah, you were saying that you did not have the 11 rendered. Uh, I don't have 11 rendered, do you? Yeah, no, that's fine, I, I do, so. Cool. I only got to about page 165 on this, so I've not quite completed the chapter yet. We don't have to do it all. No. Hopefully I run out of time before too long. Let's see, oh no, do I not have it? Oh no. I don't feel like it took long to render though. Let's see real quick. I can't believe I, oh wait, 11. Where are you? HTML 11, let's see. Sorry about that. Oh, I do have it. Sorry, yeah, I got it. I'm good. Yeah, no worries. Cool. It rendered it in the same directory. Although I didn't do the, no, I did do, yeah. The thing is uh, just switching to HTML and all is good. Um, let me see, where do I share? I share from here. I just have several several uh, windows. Okay, yeah, all right. So the assumptions and diagnostics. So, oh, yeah, cool. so I think we all know mostly what these are, validity. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, 
representativeness. Yep. So yeah, it represents your population. That makes sense. Additive, mm -hmm. Additivity and linearity. Yes, yes, that all makes sense. Um, independence of errors violated in time series, spatial, and multi level settings. It's violated uh, in so many ways. Violated so many ways. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, basically yeah. it's the worst assumption because you the worst can of the assumption. Well, yeah, I, I, the more you think about it, you think, is it truly independent? Eh, probably not. Uh, <laughs> it would be great if it was. Uh, equal variance of errors. Uh, heteros. How, how do you say it? Heteros, is it heteros? Scudacity. Scudacity? Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those words I read that don't oh. say often. Um, oh, and then it, it says this issue is, in most cases, the issue is minor, although there are ways to account for it. Um, and then normality of errors is, is one. And, and they kind of mention here, and they've mentioned elsewhere, uh, don't get too hung up on your quantile quantile plots. Um, yeah, I was really surprised by that. Because um, I because I like typically that's what I would always do is just kind of you, you go through those usual diagnostics, right? They just say, oh, look at this. This looks not very normal. Um, yeah, but they say we do not recommend diagnostics of the normality of regression. Um, let's see. If there's more. It does not assume or require that the predictors themselves be normally distributed, just the errors. Um, and the normal distribution on the outcome refers to the regression errors, not the raw data. It's possible for the data Y to be far from normally distributed, even when coming from a linear regression model. So let's see, failures. If possible, change the model so it more faithfully coheres. It makes sense. Yes, and the software is easier. Um, let's see. Causal inference. Other assumptions are necessary to give it a causal interpretation. Causal inference can be considered a form of prediction in which we are interested in what would happen if we set them to different values. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Plotting is helpful. We all agree. So here they're saying, display it as a function of one input variable, and we get this. Uh, let's see, we left out the poor regression. Yeah, we left out the prob equals zero. That would have included the 95% interval. So we don't see that here. I think they probably show it in the book. And it's Lazy. not very exciting. It's reasonably tight um, around here. So let's see, uh, we originally plotted these, use a single plot. The conditional effects approach is oriented toward making one plot per predictor. So they do that. So here's the high school and then here's the IQ. You can see how they affect it. Fortunately, a lot more graduated high school than didn't. <laughs> That's great. Um, and yeah, then yeah, you yeah, the IQ uh, just kind of all over. The range it does bring you to that weighting thing doesn't it yes. right oh and then so so this this was i like that they answered a question i had in the last chapter which was do you know if this is better um because i believe their conclusion was no <laughs> so uh, they they fit it with the interaction and so we see what again we saw before um, let's see. So here we've loaded the model. And so we say, here's the summary and make our version. So again, What's conditional effects function do. Let's see, conditional effects and plot, which makes our version. I, I don't know what this robust and spaghetti is. That's interesting. Hmm. Well, I know what robust is, but I don't know what spaghetti is. Here, let's, let's pull it up real quick. So, conditional, does it not have it? Where is he referring to this? Conditional effect. Is that in the code itself? No. Where is that coming from? Hmm. hmm. 
Hmm. Okay, so I am using the right help here. Oh, wait, it does, it, it does have it on the... Um, oh, it does. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is... Uh, there we go. Okay, great. Uh, display conditional effects of one or more numeric or categorical predictors, including two-way interaction. So here's what you can do. X effects. And what do these things mean? So I particularly wondered what spaghetti is. Okay, it indicates if, oh, spaghetti plots only used for numeric. All right. Oh, the spaghetti plots are just with all the different lines, I guess. Oh, uh, okay. Now I understand. Uh, spaghetti through, yeah. All right, that makes sense. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, the spaghetti's uh, facing every which way. Oh, of course, lines. right. Because I only saw the two lines. I thought it was a ribbon at first. Yeah. So there's two uh, through there. And then yeah. robust is... Oh, spaghetti args. <laughs> so that's where it says gray 67. Yeah. So that's what they're doing there. So mother's IQ, child test. Okay, so they did that. So now they say mom high school and IQ from 10 3. What does it look like? Did our refresher. And now we have conditional effects again. So they only use 10 samples. And so the first one they plot, oh yeah, they just say plot, blah, blah, blah. And then they're selecting out two. So that's the mom's IQ. And then they're selecting out one. So that's the high school. And then they just plot them side by side. And you get spaghetti here too. What's the point of this? What they're trying to show us here? I mean, I guess it's just a way to, to visualize, you know, all the contributions. So the contribution of mm. the high school, the contribution of the IQ, just to, to get them all kind of on the same. Find one plot for each in variable. Yeah, so yeah, so it is exactly that. It's all about, um, yeah, evaluating assumptions, diagnostics, and evaluation. Yeah, and then we'll move on. Yeah, so we go through... Oh, so we, now we have a continuous predictor. They do fake data and they have A, B, theta, Z. So they just come up with a bunch of parameters. Say, what does this look like when I fit it? Y, X plus Z. What kind of thing do I get? So let's go back and remember theta was five, C was two, A is one, B is two. So A comes out to 1.24. Close to two, close to five, not bad. Um, let's see. So that says, here's how we will make the figure. So we wonder, let's see, the A, B line. Oh, so yeah, they just say, well, let's do one where Z is zero and one where Z is one. Shape is Z. Facet, yeah, so they're using facet wrap, one of my favorites. You can just <laughs> do that and it'll give you multiple plots. Um, the key here is to recognize that X is continuous, Z is discrete. Okay, yeah, I buy that, that makes sense. Uh, so, yeah, I don't really have any issues with that. Mm -hmm. uh, forming a linear predictor. They don't work well for a large number. Yeah, that would make sense if you have so many predictors. Um, so if you follow with Gelman's simulation code, he's got 100 by 10 matrix. Oh, VR, VRMS is a little more picky. It requires they're saved as a matrix column, which isn't quite what Gelman at all's code does. This adjustment solves the issue. So we've got 100 cases, we've got 10 variables. Uh, let's see, he's doing, they're doing, he is this guy. So fake is do all these random variables. C is this. Okay, data generating random variables. 
blah, blah, blah. Okay, so yeah, and then it's just saying, okay, I'm getting my Y based on my X and Z. What does it look like? Well, it looks like this. So his X, yeah, so I see this is kind of interesting. So when you actually look at the data frame, X is actually a matrix. And then you have an int and a double, which I think is what he was referring to. Yeah, you have to, you have to have a column that is actually in fact a matrix. So that's what he did. Um, let's see. Yeah, typically I never run into that kind of issue. I probably would have been tripped up pretty bad. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, yeah. It's always tricky when they throw the matrix <laughs> yeah. into data frame. It's like, um, oh, I didn't like it. Why? I don't understand. The thing is that when you get when you're looking at a lot of the more complex algorithms, that's what yeah. they're actually um, that's what they're actually using quite often behind the scenes. Right, a lot of like embedded uh, arrays. Right, that's what they say. Like with TensorFlow, a lot of it is just making sure the dimensions of all your various things are correct. Um, mm -hmm. That's where people get tripped up. Yeah, luckily they uh, do it for you. Yeah, they do it for you. Um, yeah, if you get uh, lower level, then you have to like kind of do all the bookkeeping and boilerplate. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Andrew, uh, Andrew Eng uh, basically yeah. wrote recently, you know, you used to have to know all this stuff, um, you know, when you used to have to get down into the algorithms, but more and more the, um, the what's it called? The matrix algebra, linear algebra stuff has got a lot. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the computers have got better at dealing with them, so you don't need to know half the uh well anywhere near as much as you need used to need right uh, well that's rather what he was arguing what seems to be arguing yeah. thing, I mean, it's, uh, good. Not... it's good to be aware of it but it's probably better that you don't have to deal with those kinds of things every day what you know i don't i don't know yeah i think that's why the big bucks are <laughs> yeah. that's right so let's see so we did so we did all that. Um, data is fake. X plus Z. Here's our results. So we have our 10 variables. Uh, let's see. So they didn't show their results. But if you do refit it, you'll see these match up nicely. OK, that's good. We verified that. Uh, hmm. So that's to our version of figure 11.4. The closest analog is fitted. And fitted returns point estimates with 95% intervals. So we will add those. I like that. So that's good. So let's do that. Mm, that. That's better than what they did in the book. Yeah, I like that too. I'm going to look at the book real quick. So the book is we're up to 11 C. Yeah, I like that better. I like that better. Yeah. So that's a way to do that. Okay, so now we can inspect residuals. Oh, <laughs> I spend way too much time looking at residual plots. Oh, I know. Um, divination. So here's how we make our plot. Take from one, one, find columns, you take blah, blah. So they look reasonable <coughs> excuse me it's not as uh, oh yeah no that is that that's what that's that so i was looking at a different page yeah that looks right this is yeah this is 11 3. Uh, fake data understand plot residuals versus predicted values or residuals versus observed oh and then they talk about why that might confuse you um so the parameters from the Bayesian model are estimated with uncertainty. It's expressed in their marginal posterior distributions. Residuals have uncertainty expressed in marginal posterior distributions. Also, here we give you the uncertainty of the residuals by applying them with GM point range. So point range is what they're using as a function of the original Y values. So what is this telling me then? So he's saying we have residuals that look like this, but now we have kind of the uncertainty as well. 
point range. So oh, they've created. Um, oh, here the reasons? min and the max. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the difference is they've created. So in the other ones, they've just basically created a residual plot, and in this, they've actually added uncertainty into the residual plot. Right. Is that is that is that correct? Is it, it, yeah, I think it is. GM point range. Shape equals Z, size equals one seven. Da, 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 da. Yeah, so the shape is dependent. I don't know if that gives you much, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, okay. Mm. Um, all right. It's so easy when we, they base it on real data rather than fake data. Right. When you do fake data, it's kind of like, yeah. yeah. This is what yeah. it should look like because these are random. Um, let's see. So we'll extract the residuals to make a version. I figure B11.6. I figure 11.6. Yeah, this is cool. 95%. Oh, this is nice. Yeah. So he's got point range again. So point range is in there. Um, he's got yeah. y min, y max, y intercept. That's the H line. Okay, residuals, mother's IQ. I mean, that's a, that, no, that's pretty good distribution. In, in yeah, I think so. Everything's kind of very tight here. And then these things outside. This is just one standard deviation above and below, I guess, and, mm. then, and beyond. Not so much. And that's just kind of very random, very random looking. Yeah, it's basically okay. perfect, isn't it? So if you see this, you don't get worried too much. You feel like, yeah, that's probably a, a decent model. No, uh, although they did say earlier on, don't worry too much about the residual terms. Don't, don't get hung up on block. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, that's good. You know, basically, the first thing I ever learned about in R was, oh, look, here's some data. Oh, and here's a QQ plot. Oh, yeah, exactly. You do the LM and then you plot it and, yeah, it'll show you the High leverage points, mm. all those things. Um, yeah, so so this is yeah, kind of a, a simple example. Uh, residuals versus predicted, and residuals versus observed. And then they just show about yeah. If you see this, you might say, why is it doing that? But that's actually, you know, does make sense if you think about what residuals. R versus, yeah, residuals versus observed. That goes back to what they said before about the fact that when you're modeling data, mm -hmm. you're not actually bothered about the Gaussian distribution of the data. You're bothered about the Gaussian distribution of the, um, of, yeah, of the residuals, yeah. the prediction. Yeah, so that makes sense. Uh, that actually um, was, some, was really important to me because uh, I I'd never realized that before. Well, I'm sure I'd come across it before, but I, I don't know if I processed it properly. Yeah, I mean, it's good to see it and have it um, kind of, um, you know, illustrated so nicely. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, this can be, oh, what is it? This can be understood using probability theory. They should be independent. Yeah, they should be independent of the predictors, XI, not the data, YI. Um, Makes sense. All right. Understanding the choice using fake data simula simulation. So what do we have then? Yeah. Okay, we would expect this if the model was correct. That makes sense. Um, let's see. Okay, so simulation-based checking of fitted normal distribution. Posterior predictive simulated replicated data sets under the fitted model, comparing these to the observed data. Okay. So what's going on here? What's happening? He's doing a histogram. Oh, just saying X versus Y. Did an intercept only regression model. It's 26. 
Oh, what is he doing here? Uh, slice sample 20. He's trying to create, uh, what's it? Uh, oh, he's just doing uh, loads and loads of, yeah, he's creating loads and loads of uh, um, histograms because of the different simulations, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, y equals map to, so just based on these little slices, he's doing, he's mapping it to these plots, so or this, these data sets, rather. Yeah. So this yeah. section is called comparing data to replication of data models. So, uh, so, so far we've considered several uses of simulation, exploring the implications of hypothesized probability models, exploring the implications yeah. of CISC models that will fit to data and studying properties of statistical procedures by comparing estimates to known true value parameters. Here we introduce posterior prediction checking, simulating replicated data sets under <clears throat> models and then comparing these to observed data. Hmm. It's an interesting approach. Yeah. Okay, so now he's doing posterior predict. N equals 1,000. So new data, oh yeah, so new data is just one to 1,000. Um, and they're choosing 66, 66 samples. Uh, let's see. And there's so many uh, deprecated ones. So now we're looking at this again. We see what that looks like. Okay, so as we jump the gun, we'll do something very similar with PP check. So plot 19 histograms of synthetic data nested to a histogram of next, not nest, uh, to, yeah. So PP check. Oh, so yeah, so this is just saying this is what you actually had. This is what your replications look like. How do we feel about this? I guess it's a, <laughs> I guess it's a good reflection. Um, yeah. Feels like if you look at this, you think this one's got a much tighter distribution, but I don't know. Probably because of these uh, guys here. It's a lot more, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's acute, isn't it? It's kurtosis is yeah. um, a lot more pr yeah. pronounced. The other ones are a lot oh. more Gaussian. Right. Oh, yeah. So you can even see here as well. So, yeah, the, the original one has got this very sharp peak. And then, and then all these replications. Yeah, it doesn't look very good. <laughs> it's not very good for this theory. <laughs> I don't think so. No. I think I think the idea though is that if you do this, then you can flag things like this, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so data displays could suggest more focused test statistics. So they have a test function. What did they do? Okay. Right. Use test to make this figure. Compute the minimum value for each of the synthetic data sets. The minimum value is marked by the red vertical line. So that what is he saying? If we just do these tests and in our Synthetic data sets, this would be the minimum of everything versus in, reality, in our actual data set we saw it way down here. Is that what they're saying, I guess? The numerical data set? Summarize. What is observation from each 20 plus? Yeah. This is about as far as I've got. Um, Do you want to pick it up from here next time? Maybe we are at the after four here after what is it nine oh seven there? You guys, uh, yeah, it's okay. Um, well, um, yeah, whatever works for you. Um, sure, I suppose we can pick yeah, up because we've gotten four. to the end of this bit, really. Yeah, um, I think we did. Yeah, actually, uh, and then the next bit's a bit of time series stuff. Which yeah. is quite nice. I might, uh, 
I might I might uh, just build um some Bayesian models and you know Bayesian time series just mm -hmm. to just for fun to talk That'd about be... those. Yeah. But I mean I think I, I mean a lot of this is quite is a lot more theoretical. He's trying to get the theory into your head about what the variance is and what it explains. Right. So it probably isn't really that important to do that. I mean, like, you know, it talks about cross-validation later. It's like, well, we use cross-validation all the time. The reason why we use it is because it's better than not doing cross-validation. Right. Um, yeah, it's... And it's I, cool. I feel like they're trying to say it's better than relying on just, you know, some number that's spit out of your, uh, <laughs> you know, model uh, generation that you did. Yeah, well, you know, 100% agree. I think, you know, things like uh, bootstrapping and, um, and yeah, yeah. Si simulation, et cetera, have massively <clears throat> improved modeling. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then, uh, well, you know, finish that next week and then we get on to transform transformations, mm -hmm. which is pretty, um, I mean, I mean, I imagine you come across this in your daily job as much as I do, which is you yeah. do lots of transformations because you have to. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't work at all. Awesome. I do wonder what the Bayesian aspect of transformation is, though. I'd be curious to see. I can't really see it being any different than the normal one. Right. Hmm. And then after chapter 12, we are in part three, generalized linear models. So we're in an entirely new segment of the book so yeah all right looking at it uh, makes a pretty good progress now oh my word yeah uh, <laughs> i just found some <laughs> stuff at the back what's that i'm not sure if i knew it was there uh, there's this um at the back for page 480 480 uh, there's um a lot of like additional information examining data oh yeah These answers to questions. Oh, just uh, it's just ten quick. Oh, ten tips. quick tips. Yeah, it's not four ninety three. I must have a different edition of the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, he right. says they say forget about statistical significance. <laughs> forget about what? Sorry. Oh, they say yeah. Tip two: oh, yeah. forget about statistical significance. Graph the relevant and not the irrelevant. It many models. Yeah, it makes sense. Set up a computational workflow, yes. Might be worth going over that. I think the most interesting stuff for us will be uh, towards the end when they start talking about more of the technical aspects because a lot of what we're yeah. doing at the moment is uh, this is a regression. Uh, in yeah, Bayesian, right. we do lots of repetition in order to build uncertainty. Where are you looking for uncertainty? Where are you looking for distributions? Right. Um, your assumptions aren't really different from normal uh, parameters, apart from we add additional um, information about the uh, about the estimates. Sorry, right. about the ad additional information in the model checking procedures, um, which is pretty cool as well. Um, I was surprised that it, the tidy version is way better. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's all cool. It's very good. All right. So anyway, uh, thanks very much. Thanks for your time, Steve. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you. And uh, we'll pick it up next week, I guess. Yeah, we'll do. All right. Well, take care. Take care.